In the <clears throat> acknowledgement of the, ter the territory that we uh, are situated on, and when I say we, it is I speak for myself and for the Games Institute because I happen to live very close on campus. Uh, if you happen to be at a at a different location, I will let you acknowledge the territory, the traditional territory, um, where wherever you are. But for myself and the Games Institute uh, and the University of Waterloo. We are located on the Haldeman Tract, uh, um, land that was taken without consent from the First uh, Nations of um, the neutrals, uh, the neutral Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee people. Uh, then the land was returned in the Haldeman Tract agreement. However, um, as history has it, uh, that didn't quite happen as um, as promised, and so we are now. Again, we being the Games Institute, University of Waterloo, and I, and those of us who live in the region uh, within 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River, we acknowledge the enduring presence and traditional knowledge of the for, uh, of the indigenous peoples who uh, whose land we now live on. Um, and the, the Games Institute, uh, we obviously, uh, a lot of you know that we facilitate research of games, digital spaces, interactive technologies, and uh, we try wherever possible to make space for indigenous scholars, designers, commentators, and creators to uplift the voices that have been marginalized and excluded from the discourse uh, for many, many decades. Um, with that, welcome to the Games Institute online event, yet another one, since uh, we can't be where I pretend to be right now. Um, my name is Agatha and I uh, look after the administration and strategic planning for the Games Institute, but we, we have a number of students and faculty members, including our executive and uh, associate director here with us. Uh, and we also have Professor Oliver Schneider from uh, the Faculty of Engineering, who will be, who is a faculty member with us and um, working very, very hard to open his new brand, shiny, oh, very exciting maker lab or haptic computing lab is the actual name of the lab. Um, and I will ask Oliver to introduce our speaker today. Uh, before Oliver, just one more second. Um, uh, for all of the participants in the chat, we had posted some housekeeping rules. So uh, just to for you to know that this is recorded for those of, of, of our membership who couldn't join us. Um, keep your microphones and your cameras um, muted and turned off until the Q&A time uh, when we will invite you to interact with the speaker freely. And um, Oliver has agreed to moderate the Q&A. Um, if you have questions during the event, feel free to put them in the chat or hold them until the Q&A session where you will be able to answer, ask them directly of the speaker. Uh, and as always, uh, please participate actively uh, in the event. And because we cannot be together, uh, there are some um, interactive nonverbal emoji things and gestures that you can use. So feel free to do that so that the speaker knows that they're not, he, he's not talking just to his camera <laughs> uh, far away in Berlin. Um, and please, as always, be kind and considerate. Video communication is difficult. We don't have all the normal um, nonverbal and bodily cues that we get from uh, in-person interaction. Um, and with that, thank you very much for joining us. Oliver, I will give it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. If you don't know me, I'm Oliver Schneider. Um, I do half the things. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Tice Raman here from the Hustle Flatman Institute. Uh, I actually know Tice from my time there, I did my postdoc there. Um, and Tice is a PhD candidate, uh, but he's getting close to graduation. So in the next year, he's actually going to go on the market. And uh, so we might see him in a different role in the next year or two. So exciting to see where that goes. Um, he'll be talking about portable laser cutting. I'm not going to introduce the topic because I bet he'll do a way better job than I will. What I will mention is that I think this topic is both really important for a lot of different potential uh, industries or or um, types of activities you may have to do with uh, anything from creating new uh, objects to interacting more generally with physical interactive systems. Um, but Tice is a man of many talents. So if you have visited the GI at all, uh, you probably have seen his name since he assisted me with the, the dual panto project, which has a poster. So uh, we worked together on that project. He was instrumental in making that happen. And he has also run um, multiple marathons. So man of many talents. Uh, <laughs> but let's hear about his focus of his PhD work, portable laser cutting. Tice, take it away. Thank you so much for that introduction, Oliver. So. Um, I welcome you to my, my name is Tai Rama and I welcome you to my talk on portable laser cutting. This is work that I did together with my supervisor, Patrick Baudis at the Hasselblad Institute in Potsdam. 
So when I started to do research into laser cutting, laser cut models look something like this. It's a 2D, a 2D vector file, which um, sort of indicates the path that the laser is going to follow. And so as a result, just by staring at this file, you have a reasonable idea of what is going on, what is going to be fabricated here. And, and you know, like it's, it's, it's an easy to edit, kind of easy, low key uh, model that you can share and, and fabricate. But today, the purpose of my talk is that I'm going to tell you that this model, this type of model will have to die. And let me show you why. So let's like start by talking about a field that we are all much more familiar with, which is the field of digital computing. So if you look at the history of digital computing, you've probably seen charts like this, where like the amount of users or the amount of devices or any sort of like the amount of software that's written, any of these dimensions sort of has this exponential um, scaling in, in, in over time. And me as a researcher in digital fabrication, I'm sort of curious if there are like pivotal moments in that history of computing that, um, that made this happen, that made this go the way it went. And if we can borrow from those pivotal moments and see what that could possibly mean in the context of digital fabrication. So with digital fabrication, we're not quite there yet, right? Like we're, we're sort of a couple of decades behind the, the kind of evolution curve of, of uh, digital computing. So that's, that gives us this great advantage that we can sort of look at the history and see that as some sort of the outcast for the future of, of the field of digital fabrication. So one, one pivotal moment that has happened in the context of, of digital computing was, um, was a moment where we moved from thousands of users to millions of users. And uh, when I asked my students, when I teach the introduction to programming, I asked my students like what, what they think that moment was, I typically get a response like um, object orientation or something like that, which is makes sense, right? In the scope of their lifetime, that has been one of the more pivotal moments in the history of computing. But I think there was an even more pivotal moment just right before that, which was the introduction of compilers. And I think with compilers is that we start to abstract away from the hardware. So we got to a point where, we, where all the code that was written until that time worked for one specific machine in one particular lab in one context, and therefore was not really relevant for what, whatever other machines were like around. And then since the introduction of compilers, we started to abstract away from that. So we started to develop languages that are a higher level, like, um, like Lisp and C, for example. And these languages are still around today because since, since we started to kind of abstract away, we got to a point that, that, that the languages remained useful uh, for, the, for the, 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 the end of time. And so when I try to understand what that means in the context of digital fabrication, I sort of want to see if there is like an equivalent moment, if there is also a moment, a pivotal moment that we can enable with, with research that allows us to go from thousands of users to millions of users in the context of digital fabrication. And so in the context of computing, we call this concept portability, right? It's like the ability of software to be transferred from one machine or system to another. And we tend to capture that notion in the form of a standard, which is an established normal requirement for a repeatable technical task. And so if you put that all on sort of like a larger timeline, we've seen this happen in the context of computing where we had like the hardware first and that worked for a while. We started to develop specific code to make that hardware work really well. And then after the introduction of compilers, we had like portable code. But we've seen that same sort of like pivotal moment happen to all different types of digital content that were used on these computers. For example, the idea of this in the field of desktop publishing, right? We had the introduction of the hardware that was already in the 60s, but only after the introduction of PostScript by Adobe and later the Adobe PDF standard, um, we got to a point that we had files that were reliably working across different pieces of hardware. They were working across different uh, machinery. And that, that remained relevant up till today for that very reason. We've seen the same with digital video, digital audio. Essentially, any form of digital content has gone through such a transition where it started out being very hardware specific and then became something that actually kind of remained relevant across different machines. So the more general definition of portability would be the ability of something to be transferred from one machine or system to another. And so me as a researcher in, in digital fabrication, I'm wondering what that means in the context of laser cutting. So it would be the ability of the models for laser cutting to be transferred from one machine or system to another. And that is the challenge that I set out to, uh, to tackle in the context of my PhD. And uh, in, the, in the scope of, of working on that, I published this uh, series of Kai and Wist papers. And the uh, ones that are highlighted in big here are the main ones that I will kind of highlight throughout this talk. So let's look at where we, where we started, where we, where we were standing by the time I started to do my research. So I already showed you this, this cutting plan. This thing here is actually a microscope. And you know, there's a lot of great things about this particular cutting plan here. For one, um, back when laser cutting was introduced back in the, six, uh, in the 60s, um, the, the, the way to drive like a laser cutter was essentially control the individual motors and the individual laser, um, laser software, it's, uh, the hardware itself. 
So you had to directly kind of interface with the machine that you had uh, at, at, at hand. And then later in the 80s, it was like, uh, as, as laser cutters went more commercial, there was a need for like some sort of higher level format, some sort of ability to continue to work on different laser cutters, even though the machine has been slightly changed. And so this was the introduction of G-code, which was like um, invented already in the 50s, but became the standard for laser cutting around the 80s. And one big step forward is what, what the, the cutting plans that we just saw. It's like these line drawing SVG cutting plans um, that sort of convert into G-code by a driver. So they, they are, again, one level further abstracted away from the specifics of the hardware. And you have different colors of the lines that kind of allow you to make uh, mode switches of the laser cutter. So, you know, we came a long way. A lot of great things about this cutting plan. But is something fundamentally broken if we look at these? So here is, again, that microscope. And um, in order for this thing to become a microscope, it's a 3D model, right? Like, so the individual plates, they need to connect with each other. For example, this like little prong here that you see on the side wants to connect in this cutout of this microscope part here. And in order for that to work, they, they are fit together. You press them into one another. Now, the problem is what we're looking at here is a vector file. So when I have a laser cutter that might remove more material than another laser cutter, those lines would effectively become thicker, right? And as a result, the cutout here gets bigger and the prong gets smaller. And you can imagine that that is, that is not great for the model, right? Like now the parts don't fit with each other anymore. They just fall apart uh, when you touch them. And the same problem occurs the other, the other way around. If the laser removes more, uh, less material, you have thinner lines. And so now the cutout here gets narrower, but at the same time, this prong here gets wider. So again, like we will have a file that will not work. These will not fit together. And the problem is every laser cutter is a little bit different than every other laser cutter that you might encounter. And not even that, like even um, at a different time in the day, if the air circulation is a little different, um, models may come out differently. And so this problem occurs every time you're trying to laser cut something. And not only that, but also in other parts. Like for example, here is a bearing uh, that needs to hold an axle in place. And again, the same sort of problem occurs, right? Like if the hole gets, if the, the, the cutout gets too small, um, the bearing might end up like uh, jamming itself in place. And if it gets too big, you might have like a, an axle that just kind of wobbles around in its, in its bearing. And so imagine if a way in which we could handle these two problems, then we would in some ways have like some sort of like model that will continue to work on any laser cutter because we kind of could, could abstract away from the specifics of the hardware. And, and so like, if you want to like take the desktop publishing metaphor here, that would be sort of the PDF file of laser cutting, right? You would have something that you can safely send over to somebody else and it will fabricate reliably. But there is an even bigger issue here. If I want, as I said, this thing is a microscope. And what if I want to make changes to the model? Say I want to, for example, give the, make the neck longer so that you have a different focal range. Making that type of change essentially means that you have to not only modify the part that you think needs is to be affected by it, but also all the parts that are connected to that particular part. And so if you again want to look at the desktop publishing metaphor here, that would be sort of having access to the Word or the, the LaTeX file or the source code of, of, your, of your computer program, if you will. And so these are all issues that sort of occur in these 2D cutting plans as they are right now, and they prevent us from really kind of moving forwards in the, as a field right now. So let me look at, um, first, like, take a look at what we can do in terms of creating a PDF for laser cutting. So that file that will continue to work on any machine. This was sort of my first attempt. I wanted to keep the 2D cutting plans around because they are great in many ways, but I would try to see if we can save them, if we can somehow bring that portable notion into these cutting plans as they are. So I wrote semi-automatic software tools that allow me to convert these non-portable SVG uh, cutting plans into portable ones. And there are two publications at the last iterations of WIS that are related to that. And so this is what the software looks like. It's a, it's a browser a browser application, a TypeScript application that runs in the browser, and that essentially just loads the SVG cutting plan directly in the browser, and it will be displayed as, as a cutting plan because that is already an XML format, which is, uh, can be displayed directly in the browser. And then a user comes in, and uh, makes additional annotations in that cutting plan. And you're going to see the video now once, just to kind of get a sense of what it looks like. And then later on, I will show it to you, to you again when you have more context of understanding what is really happening here. So as a user, you just have a couple of tools that, you, that allow you to sort of make modifications in the model, place these additional kind of um, geometry in there. And as I said, this thing is already an, an, an uh, SVG file, so you're looking at it straight away. So you can just save it in the end and send it directly to your laser cutter. After you made the last modification here, model looks great, you save it, you send it to the machine. And so the goal of this software is to take like 
this microscope, which is made for one particular laser cutter and works on one particular material, and turn that into this microscope, which looks very similar if you look at it at first, but there are a couple of additional cutouts that I made in this particular cutting plan, and those are sort of made by the software that you just saw. So there's one thing we did is we made the joints portable, and the other thing is we made moving parts here portable. So let's look at those joints first. So if you look from the side of that, of that uh, microscope on, on the cutting plan itself, it looks something like this. The red line is the cutting line again, and the gray zone is sort of the range which it can be modified by, by variations in curve. And the problem is like these joints are super, super stiff, right? Like they, they rely on the compression of the material and the material is very unforgiving to change in compression. So a small variation in curve will make this part fall, fall, uh, fail and fall apart. And what we're doing is we're taking this cutting plan and we're turning it into this cutting plan, which looks very similar, but it now has this additional cantilever that, that sits right next to the joint. And you see it now sort of works as I animated, it sort of works for a range, right? The, the size of that, of that cutout now can, can be extended and, and shortened. And the, the great thing is the material is very forgiving to variations in bending. So we're using that material property here to create a joint that continues to work for a range of different uh, curve configurations. And as a result, also on a range of materials. So if you look at this, this uh, game controller that you see here, um, you see that it consists of like that, that, that all these joints here have been turned into kind of cantilever based joints. And the same has happened here, even for like things that are mounted in place. So this has, this button here has to go in there. And you see that there's some sort of wrapped around version of the spring that, that keeps that button tightly in place. And the same model now works like on, on plywood as you see here, but also if you would fabricate the same thing in acrylic or a different material, which would typically really not be feasible at all. So this software is called SpringFit. It's a software tool that detects joints and mounts in models and replaces them with portable equivalents that are tolerant to variations in curve. But it's not quite a complete story yet, right? Like we were looking at this microscope and I told you that there is like that mechanism in there where parts move with respect to each other. And if I would just put a spring right next to that, we would actually introduce friction into the mechanism, which is sort of the opposite of what the mechanism was intended to, design, to do in the first place. So we were wondering if we can, again, like kind of find a way to modify that mechanism so that it continues to work independent of curve without introducing additional friction into the, the mechanism. And the trick is we can, we can do that by, by replacing the mechanism with the cutout that you see here. Let me zoom into that. So this is some sort of crescent-based inset that you jam right next to the mechanism, and that now compensates for variations in curve. Let me see, show you how that works. So if you just look at the mechanism itself, this bearing here has to hold the axle in place, right? The dash zone that you see in here. And as the curve increases, the inset would get smaller, but it also jams in further. And so as a result, the inset that is closed here by, uh, is, is, is constantly closing the gap caused by curve exactly. And all users need to do is just take that inset and jam it in place. So they don't need to understand how curve works or how their laser cutter works or any kind of like specifics to the mechanism. They just take the inset, fabricate it and laser cutter, jam it inside the cutout and then it works. So let's look at, at that in a slightly more technical uh, perspective. So the inset consists of two key features here. The outside curvature, which we refer to as the jammer, and the inside curvature, which we refer to as the inverse scalar. And if we just look at the outside curvature itself, we, can, we, we observe that it's sort of derived from a nautilus spiral, a self-similar spiral. And that is really powerful because like as curve is applied to that inset, the inset gets smaller, but the curvature stays the same because it's self-similar. So as a result, the smaller inset will always have a point where as you rotate it in place, where it is going to line up with the same uh, curvature as the outside. And that's the moment where it jams, right? So that's the moment where it holds in place. So while the jammer has to hold that inset in place, the inverse scalar now in turn has to hold the axle in place. And the great news is that we can use sort of the same logic here. We take the same self-similar spiral and we flip it. And so as a result, as there is more curve in the mechanism, the, the, the inset will rotate further. But at the same time, the, the, the shape of the cutout also gets narrower by the same amount, resulting in a bearing that has a constant size, which you see here at simulated, uh, with simulated amounts of curve. And as we simulate the curve up to actually an amount that is much bigger than most laser cutters, and you can even mill it. So you can even use different fabrication, uh, subtractive fabrication technologies to fabricate the same thing, and it continues to work independent of that. So for that reason, we call these curve canceling mechanisms. 
There are mechanisms that continue to perform their functionality independent of the amount of material removed by the fabrication machine, which is known as curve. And if we now look back at that, at that video that, that I showed you earlier, you get a bit of a sense of what's going on here. So you see the microscope here loaded in the tool. And um, there's a couple of things that, the, that uh, the software already automatically inferred. Like there are some circles and some kind of things that could possibly be mechanisms. And so these are the highlighted geometry that you see in here. But there are also some things that the software do, does not automatically find. For example, um, this rectangle here is a sliding mechanism. But just from the fact that there is a rectangle in the cutting plan, there's no way of telling that there would be a sliding mechanism there, right? It's just like you can only understand it if you know what the model really does. And so this is where the user comes in. And the user just sort of like kind of uses this tool to additionally put these additional mechanisms on their right location. For example, here, the sliding mechanism. And the same for the gear. Like there is a circular cutout there, but it doesn't know that there has to be a gear held in place there. So again, the user comes in and teaches the software those additional kind of features so that it continues to work reliably. Also some guesses that the software made that may not be accurate and you can override it here. And then when everything looks good, the user can save the model, send it to the laser cutter and, and, and fabricate the results. So here is that microscope, but now it will continue to work. All the mechanisms are kind of finely tuned even on a different laser cutter or, or if you would take the same microscope and mill it, for example. And so we took a range of models that we found in online repositories and all kind of used the software to turn them into um, curve independent equivalents that are now valuable for sharing if you think about it. Now you can send any of these files around and other people would be able to reliably reproduce those. And as you see, so these models can also be fabricated in different materials now, as long as they are reasonably similar in their stiffness. So how did we do so far? I promised you portability at the beginning of this talk. And let's just do a, a bit of a sanity check how far we got in, in that direction here. So I think all the resulting models, they cut now on any laser cutter. They even work on a range of materials, which is some sort of like nice benefit that we get on top of that. So I guess it's fair to say that we have a PDF for laser cutting here. We have some sort of model that, that works reliably as we share it. But if I look at these models, I can't help but think that there is also some sort of cost that we inferred on ourselves here, right? This thing here is an arcade machine. And it's a great model, but if you look at it, you see that it has been modified in order to become portable, right? And there are these additional cutouts that are like sort of have an aesthetic impact on the model. And they also have a bit of a structural cost to them as well. But the bigger thing that is missing here is the bigger promise that I made you at the beginning, the ability to modify the models, right? To change the neck, for example, of the microscope. That's something that actually we haven't made any progress at so far here. On the contrary, by adding additional cutouts in that cutting plan, it even gets harder to make changes to the model at this point. So, you know, it's fair to, like we have, we have something that's portable that continues to work, but that, that comes at a price right now. And so I was wondering if there is an, a completely different route that I could take where, where we don't have that additional cost that, that comes into, uh, that, that we have to pay in order to kind of achieve portability. So let's look at this model. Here's a VR headset. And, and, and you know, I'm at the Games Institute, so I'm sure you've all seen like the Google Cardboard. Um, you hold the phone, it, it holds a phone and it holds two lenses that you look through to get, to get a reasonable VR experience. But this particular model is not very inclusive if you think of it, right? If I talk about like going from thousands of users to millions of users, this model only works for people with the same interocular distance and for people with, for example, the same prescription, right? Like, like me, for example, I would want to model that model so that it works for my prescription rather than that of the original modeler. And so to make these type of modifications to the VR headset here, in 3D, it would be sort of clear what you need to do, right? Like you would take a stretch tool and you would stretch that front plate backwards so that you can uh, make it fit to your prescription, which is great. But the unfortunate truth is that you find this model not in this form, but you find it in this form if you find it in online repositories. This is the 2D cutting plan, right? It's what we looked at so far before. And you can make the same transition to the model if you want to, right? If I want to make the, the, the change the prescription of the model here, I would obviously want to change the top plate here, the, the one that we looked on from, from above. But if I do so, I also need to modify the plates that sort of connect to that top plate. So for example, this side plate here is like connected on the side to that plate. So I have to make the same modification to that particular plate. And I'm going to need your help here. So I'm going to go like through the different plates 
And every time you think that the plate needs to be modified, you can like either raise your virtual hand. I don't know. Can, can you guys all raise your virtual hand so I have a sense of like how this works in, in WebEx? Or like, um, yeah, exactly. That looks great. So you can raise your virtual hand. So as soon as like you think that the plate needs to be modified, you raise your hand and then um, we sort of vote together what we need to do here. So who thinks that these little prongs have to be modified? Maybe. I, I don't think so. They are sort of sitting on the side. You need to have some context here, I think. But they are sitting on the side to kind of create a spacer for the phone. Uh, what about this one here? See some hands coming up? Yeah, great. Yeah, so this is the plate that sits on the bottom of that VR headset, right? Like, so the top plate changes. Then I also want to change the bottom plate. Otherwise, I sort of screw the model sideways. So yeah, I would, I would make a modification here too. What about this plate here? I see some hands coming up. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, so this is the same problem again. Like, it's the, you have one side plate that you modify, you want to modify the other side plate again so that you have like a straight extrusion when you move it forwards. So what about this plate here? I, I don't think we need to change this one. Like, this is like, this, this, this holds the lenses in place. This one maybe, eh, not so much. How about this plate? So this is actually an interesting one. I'm surprised that nobody's raising their hand right now, but like um, we had like lots of discussions about this in the lab. <laughs> um, so structurally, there is no reason to modify this. So maybe I've, I've put you on the wrong track by talking about like which plates connect to each other. Because structurally, this thing does not connect to any of the plates that we want to modify. But there's an optical reason you want to modify this one because it's sort of the divider between your eyes. So if, if this, this plate does not get longer, your left eye will see content of, that is meant to be for your right eye and the other way around. So you probably want to modify this one too. But the, the, the kind of the bottom line message here is that like, you know, we came to sort of, not everybody was always at the same page of like what, what plates need to be modified and how to do this. But I think as you were doing this, what you were trying to do is you, you were like imagining like, what does the 3D model looks like? And what is the modification that I want to make? And I've obviously primed you a little bit by showing a 3D modification before already. Um, and then you think of like, okay, what is that modification? And what does that mean for the 2D cutting plans that, I, that I'm trying to modify here? And, you know, that sort of works, right? Like we, we sort of seem to have succeeded but in, based on the hand raising here. But I can't help but wonder that there must be an easier way of doing this, right? What if you had this model truly in 3D? So while I was doing my research on, on making these 2D cutting plans portable, at the lab, we were starting some bigger projects where we were trying to create a 3D modeling environment for laser cutting, which is called Cube. And um, let me just show you so quickly how that works. So here I'm trying to make like a mock-up of an espresso machine. And you just see sort of how the interface allows me to click together um, a volume relatively quickly. And then get off the grid by using some additional kind of modification tools here. Even do some more detailed sort of stretching of the model. And of, of course, you also want to, in the end, add your logo to brand your model here. So this is, this is really nice, right? Like now we have like a modeling workflow where you can, like from a UI perspective, where like in a few minutes, you will be able to model this uh, espresso machine. And, and you can even, like this, this is a great step forward compared to editing this 2D cutting plan. But from a portability perspective, there's also something very nice about this because you would be able to export the model in the end. You would export it to your particular properties for your la uh, laser cutter. And as you do so, you specify the curve here. So you can make sure you don't even have that problem where you need these springs and stuff like that that I showed before. Um, you would then like export that to this particular kind of cutting plan for your machine. And if you do not happen to know what the curve of your machine is, you would, you would print like, um, it, would, it would print out like first a test strip that allows you to tune uh, the curve of your machine and then pick the right model that you, that you had in mind. So, and, and we have like, at this point, we have like five to 600 uh, beta testers that are mo making models all the time. So all of these models are inherently uh, portable, right? They would fabricate on any laser cutter and they are also all parametric. Like you can continue to modify them or even like kind of make something more advanced based on the models that you find out there. So with this software, in many ways we're done, right? Like all the issues I started, started out with, like one, two, and three, like the ability to kind of reproduce the same model and the ability to modify the model, they work at this point. And everybody can edit and even build on it, make more advanced models from it. But as it's, it's easy to say this as a researcher, right? To say like, oh, here's another way of, of, of solving 
um, your, your modeling needs. We all need to start using 3D. But the truth is there's a lot of really, really nice models out there um, that have been made by people with a lot of effort and, and, and work in the past. Not only the maker community, but there are entire companies that are sort of relying on these 2D cutting plans. They spend a lot of like good engineering knowledge that is embedded in these models, if you will. And the problem with models that, that work reasonably well, like these, these, these 2D cutting plans, they end up like remaining the standard. And the thing with standards is, well, they tend to stick. So I don't know if any of you play the guitar, but like when I was born, this is how people shared like uh, annotations for, for guitar tabs, right? Like, so this is like, it's an ASCII format and it has all the information you need in order to be able to play this, uh, this, this riff that you see here. But the, the thing is, this is something I downloaded a month ago from a repository. And that's sort of the problem, right? Like we can all imagine a better way of, 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 of embedding that information. There are much nicer ways of editing uh, these, these guitar tabs and, and, and sharing those but they're just good enough. They have all the information in there to be playable and therefore they stay around. And I'm a little bit worried that as long as like, we don't do something more serious to kind of change the, the way people share models, um, the, the workflow for modifying that VR headset is never going to look like this, but it's going to look like this, right? It's that effort that we just went through where we tried to figure out which plates have to be modified and how to modify them. And so to figure out how complicated that really is, we did a user study in our lab and uh, we had 13 people kind of go through that effort that you just went through. And uh, this took on average 24 minutes to modify this VR headset and 11 out of 13 models failed when we fabricated them. And so I started wondering if users have to mentally reconstruct the 3D model out of the 2D plates, why can't we go to 3D right away? Why don't we write software that makes this more uh, convenient? And so this is where Assembler Cube comes in. So there already is software that allows you to take 3D models and turn it into 2D cutting plans, right? Like Cube and FlatFab and other 3D modeling environments. But there's nothing that allows you to take the 2D cutting plans and turn it into a 3D model. And even though that feels like a bit of a workaround, right? To modify that model, to first turn it into a 3D model, then stretch it and then export it again. Um, but this workflow turned out to be 10 times faster and all models worked as a result. So let's look at what Assembler Cube really is. So Assembler Cube actually uh, runs in Cube itself and it allows the user to sort of puzzle together the plates into a 3D model. That's only one step of the algorithm. Let's look at the overall algorithm. So it's a five-step algorithm that converts 2D cutting plans uh, in SVG format into 3D formats, and in this case, Cube. So let's look at the individual steps. So the first step is um, we, we detect plates by, by identifying the nesting order of the cutting plans and then alternatingly assigning them to either uh, cut out or plate. Then we identify joints in the model uh, by looking at like um, uh, 45 degree, uh, 90 degree left right turns in the paths and identifying where the joints could go. Uh, then we use that information to derive the material thickness. And then we try to pair up the individual joints. And in the last step, we have the semi automatic assembly workflow that you just saw where your user sort of puzzles together the last bits of the, of the modeling workflow. And in the interest of time for this talk, I'm going to focus on the last two elements of that, of that algorithm. So here is the VR headset again. And we've already succeeded at identifying what the plates are in the model. Uh, we've already found the joints on the, on the plates and uh, we derived the material thickness. So then the next thing we need to achieve here is to kind of find out um, which joints pair up with each other. And I'm going to need your help here again. So like, because you, you guys did great so far, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you're up for this task. So I would like you to kind of uh, raise your hand when you think um, the highlighted plate that I'm going to highlight needs to be connected to this particular plate here. And just as a um, heads up, this plate is like the back of that VR headset, like the thing that holds the phone in place. So who thinks it needs to be connected to, uh, like it, it's connected to this plate here? Nah, what about this plate here? Also not. Oh, some, some people, no, I don't, I don't think so. Like, so this is the, 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 the divider in between. What about this plate here? Yeah, this is a, that, that, that's indeed like, so this is the, the bottom plate of that uh, VR headset. So this is again, like this way where the, the back plate certainly wants to be connected. It's connected here at the, at the front here. What about this plate? Yeah, so this is sort of the same problem again, right? Like, so like this, this, this joint here kind of goes there and this joint can go there. And so you guys are great here, right? Like you just, uh, just by staring at this model, you actually figured out what, what plates connect to each other and how this works. And I think as you were doing this, um, you, have, like, you have not been trying to kind of compare, say, this joint 
to this individual feature here, right? You don't, because you see that they are so clearly distinct from each other. But an algorithm can, cannot quite do that. As an algorithm, you would have to compare every joint to every other joint in order to kind of achieve this, which would, would lead to quadratic complexity, uh, which is not very feasible for the interactivity that we want in the, in the next step of our algorithm. So we try to encapsulate that, no, that nature of like, well, this joint really doesn't want to fit here. And we try to do that by, um, by uh, storing the joints in a lookup table. So we take all the joints, we store them in a lookup table, and we, um, we give them a key that is connected to that lookup table that is based on the signature of the joint. So we only have to compare joints that are similar to the joints that we are looking at in the first place. Let's look at how that works, for example, for this joint here. So we zoom into the joint. Um, this is what the joint looks like. And, uh, and what, what, we're, what we, were, we started out trying to do is to just take like, okay, well, let's take the shape of that finger and find cutouts in the model that fit to that shape, right? Like that's, so like we would just, the signature of the joint would just be the shape of that finger. But the problem here is that this finger wants to mate with a slightly smaller feature somewhere else in the model. And, uh, and for a hash data structure, which is the data structure that we're using to store this, something that's slightly smaller is, is you will not find it, right? It's like it's a zero, zero outcome. You will not find a matching result. And so what, we're, what we ended up doing in, instead is like looking at the feature that sits right next to it as well, which is a cutout. And that cutout is, is compensated by the, by the same amount again, right? Like the, 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 the cutout in the other side is made smaller by curve so that the finger fits in there. And therefore the finger on the other side is made bigger to compensate for um, the cutout here. So the sum of these two makes some sort of signature that is robust to variations in curve. And that now allows us to use the hash data structure to find collisions in the hash. And uh, so if we look at this, this signature in the hash, we find like these six collisions here that are marked in orange here that therefore allow us to like in linear time actually explore all the connections in the model. And, and we get a list of like K different candidates per, for every joint, right? These are the collisions in the hash. And so um, I wish I could tell you that it was only one candidate here because then we were done, right? Then we had the model completed and we would be great. But we still have to disambiguate between those six different options that you have here. And that's where we bring in the user in the last step. So now you uh, see again like the workflow where the user loads the 2D cutting plan into the editor. And um, as a user, you use an assemble tool to now sort of puzzle this together. So you click on one of these plates and you see that every time the joints that are candidates are highlighted uh, in, in yellow. Sometimes the orientation of a plate might be off. So for example, like in this case, it actually was correct, but you can, if the orientation is wrong, you can use this rotate icon that you see here um, to flip the plate and get a different orientation. But as I said, in this case, the orientation was correct. So we can just undo that and continue to model. And you see that actually like there's only a few joints that are highlighted at every given moment in time. So for a user, this is actually a very tractable problem to, to solve. So a fun puzzle, if you will. And then once you're done doing that, the great thing is you're in a 3D modeling environment already. So making that modification, like stretching the headset in this case, is, is just taking a different tool and you continue to model rather than some additional kind of pipeline or workflow. And you just make your stretch operation. And now you have a VR headset that is a 3D model and that can, is therefore like uh, allows for parametric changes and as well as fabricating on any laser cutter uh, you might find. And so here's like a bit of a video of like different types of models that we have been assembling. We have been assembling hundred models that we found in online repositories. And this is sort of nice to watch. So um, I'm puzzling together a chair here. And just kind of pay attention to the, all the different types of connections and structures that you see in these models. There is like a candle holder. See like a highly symmetrical model, which is not ideal for the algorithm, but also works great in the end. Um, here's a birdhouse. And you see that sometimes the orientation of the plates is still off, but then a couple of clicks of that rotate icon, you actually kind of get that right. Uh, here's the microscope we looked at earlier. Uh, Raspberry Pi rack, because somebody needs to mine the Bitcoins. Test tube holder. And of course, we could also not resist the urge to reconstruct a dinosaur. And these hundred other models that we found in online repositories. And so this is a great thing because like all these models are now inherently 3D models and they can all be modified and continue to, uh, to make more interesting um, and, and fit to your use case. 
And on top of that, can they fabricate on any laser cutter right now? So like we took those models that were very specific for one particular laser cutter and could not be modified and turned them into these amazing 3D models that you can now do a lot of stuff with. And so here's a bit of a sneak preview for uh, what, is, what is hopefully coming up at WIST, uh, WIST 2021. Uh, so this is in, in review right now. But so we are trying to push this one step further. And that is, um, you sort of workflow, which is sort of nice, right? Like you, you sort of puzzle together a model, but you still need to understand a little bit what you're looking at, right? Like if you just wanted to have that VR headset because you're just interested in gaming, um, you may not necessarily know how the individual plates connect, or you may not even care how the individual plates connect. And so to take that bit of like kind of skill that is required to do that manual workflow out of the loop as well, we try to automate the entire workflow. And so that's what you see here. Now we're loading the VR headset. And our algorithm, algorithm in the back end um, explores this exponential space of uh, ways to connect these plates here and uh, presents you with an assembled model in, in a few seconds, which you can now immediately um, modify, right? This is the same thing as what we've seen before. So as a user, now you need to know nothing about the model anymore. And so this is how it works in the back end. We use a beam search algorithm to kind of identify uh, how the plates can be connected. So we start with the plate with the most joints, and then we try to connect the other plates um, at every step to that, to that uh, assembly. We rate those based on how good an assembly we think these are. And that is, of course, the key of the algorithm here. And then we pick the four best candidates at every level, and we continue to, um, to recursively call that algorithm. And so the key really here is to understand like what is a good assembled model, which we embedded in the heuristics for this algorithm. And it allows you to, in a few steps, actually have that, uh, that VR headset reconstructed here. And here you see just like the importing of a couple of other models as well. You see like it always takes a couple of seconds, like two, three typically. And then you have like a nice assembled model that you can continue to uh, model um, immediately. All right, so in conclusion, I've shown you um, the state of the art, the 2D cutting plans, and, and what are the sort of problems that arise in, in these models, right? So there's the three different types of problems uh, that are all related to kind of the, the specific, specificity of the hardware or the use case the model is intended for. I've also shown you how the 2D cutting plans inherently pose like some sort of risk here of like kind of uh, having to modify each and every part of that model uh, in synchrony. And so that 3D models are sort of the, the answer. Like if you had a 3D model, you would have like something that actually continues to work reliably. And so I think this is like a small step towards what could be portability in the context of laser cutting. So the ability of models to be transferred from one machine or system to another. And you know, if any of the digital formats that we looked at in the beginning are some sort of indicator, you get some sort of sense of how big of a transition that could be, right? If we really had like 3D uh, models as the portable format, as the standard for laser cutting, um, this might be a pivotal moment. This might be the moment that the content that is created from now on remains relevant into the future, as opposed to the 2D cutting plans we've seen before. So when I uh, convince my students in the introduction to programming that compilers were sort of that pivotal moment in the history of computing, where we went from thousands to millions of users, I hope that today I've like shown you that like with the introduction of uh, 3D models, we set a, a great step towards that kind of achieving that same sort of pivotal moment uh, in the future of digital fabrication. And so to zoom out one step further, um, we've seen this, pipe, this, this, this sort of like history of computing, but of course there was not one single pivotal moment in that history of computing, right? So if you zoom out further, it's an exponential curve. So the curve stays the same, but there have been many other kind of pivotal moments since that particular moment in time. And as again, as a researcher in digital fabrication, I would be very interested to kind of take on more of these pivotal moments in my future uh, research career and, and use this as like, opportunities to kind of find new new potential for how to fuel the field of digital fabrication forwards as well. So there was like the introduction of like uh, reuse or components, re reusable components, right? Like so um, in, in the 60s, later the idea of configurators came around. In the late 1990s, even mobile computing, which was a, really a pivotal moment where we went from millions of users to billions of users, if you think of it. And so to show that I'm actually kind of um, really trying to push towards any of these. I also kind of made some envisionment research where we tried to figure out like what that future could look like. Like what would it be like if we had mobile fabrication instead of mobile uh, as, as a parallel to mobile computing? So here's a quick like uh, wrap up of a video uh, where we try to envision what it would be like if my bike lamp breaks in a future where we have um, mobile fabrication. So my bike lamp is second down. And you saw already that I was like, carrying some sort of placeholder technology here, like it's a 3D printer that is like mobile, 
by, by making it mobile in this particular case. Um, and so you could fabricate a mechanical solution at the moment you encounter the mechanical problem, the same way we solve information problems, and then continue to, to ride home safely. And so, as I said, this was some sort of envisionment we did back in 2016, but it sort of kind of shows the potential use of like this, this type of future. And I think um, the technology itself is almost there, right? Like, I mean, it's still like, it's a big clunky 3D printer I'm taking with me. So there's certainly more research that we can do in that direction. Uh, but I would be very excited to kind of uh, continue that track of research uh, in, in, in my future uh, lab. So on that note, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, look very much forward to discussion. Thank you, Thijs. Um, I made the oversight earlier. Uh, so this is really super, super cool stuff. I made the oversight earlier of not giving an overview of how uh, the rest of the day is going to unfold. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to questions for the next 10, maybe 15 minutes or so uh, for everyone assembled here. Um, and then at around 2 o'clock Eastern, maybe 2.05, uh, we're going to gracefully transition to more of a meet and greet. And so that will be a bit more of a casual um, discussion with Tice and uh, anyone assembled here, um, which will be great. And then I think at about 3 p.m. Eastern, we're going to switch over to a faculty meet and greet. That's a little bit more focused on the faculty members that uh, are around. So I'm going to be moderating the rest of this afternoon. Um, so, uh, let's begin with any questions. Uh, if you have a question, just raise your hand, uh, as we've seen in, uh, the often the, uh, <laughs> awesome interactive parts of the talk and, uh, I'll, uh, pick you up for a question. And if no one raises their hand, I'll be forced to come up with a question by that. I mean, I've got a couple that I want to ask, uh, Dan, why don't you take it away? Uh, and feel free to unmute and open up your camera uh, as well. Um, open up. Good unmute to see you, Dan. Hey, good to see you, Tees. Great <laughs> talk. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. So, um, I had a question that I'm sure you have a great answer because I do a lot of woodworking, so I deal with kerf all the time in terms of uh, routers and saw blades and so on. I typically just um, measure my kerf and then adjust for that. So the first project you showed. Is there not just like, you know, I think I'm missing something, just like a one-time calibration where I'm about to print, I've got my SVG, I measure the kerf of me or the, or even just the compressive qualities of the material, make some global adjustment. I don't have to have all these extra cutouts and things like that that you added. Yeah, yeah, that is certainly, um, that is sort of what, what, what we can do right now, right? Like, so that's what you're doing in the lab and that's what I've been doing like in my, in my life so far as well. Um, yeah, so you can you can you can um, make a curve strip, right? Like so, you measure the curve of your machine, and then you adjust the file accordingly. Um, this is certainly a workflow that works, and um, it's it's sort of it's it's the burden on the the end user here somehow. So like I think if that that is totally a fine workflow for me and for you and for you know the people who are interested in laser cutting themselves, because we 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 understand like we try to understand how the machine works and what it does to to like how how, how that works, how we can do something cool with that. Um, I think it's a little bit different if we talk about the use case of like these other 99% of people that are maybe not necessarily inherently interested in the fabrication machine itself, but they just want to have the result. And, and so like if that's the sort of the, the way you're thinking about the laser cutter, um, you would just like uh, in, with, with these modified models, you just send it out. Like you don't need to worry about it. You just like you take the model, you download it online, you just send it straight to the laser cutter. It will continue to work. So it's more some sort of guarantee and you can indeed, you can, you can totally, there are workarounds for it right now, thank God. Otherwise um, we would not have any uh, laser cutting going on so far. Um, but I think this, this sort of tailors more to that user that is not necessarily interested in the technology itself, is more interested in the result of the, of the machinery. And the other thing is the nice thing that, that, that comes as a side effect of this is that um, by making the conversion once as the creator of the model, there's one person who has to go through the effort of kind of modifying the model now. Whereas um, if you share a model, then everybody who wants to use that model. So it's like either one person takes the X minutes to kind of modify the model or everybody needs to do it whenever they try to fabricate. So there's some sort of like from an overall workload perspective, you shift the workload to one person who knows what he's doing rather than like having to, um, to, to make it from like shift to all the other users that are using the final model in the end. But a good question, yeah. And I just had one follow up with that. It also reminds me when you're doing um like uh, trim carpentry, like say you're like framing a door, or framing a window, the trick is always never try to do it like perfectly matched, if you know what mm. I mean. Like, so you have the door jam and the trim, you never want those two things. You always leave like a few, like four millimeters or something like that. 
as a reveal, but it's really a trick knowing that you can never get it perfectly accurate. So in yeah. some ways you've created your curfing system has created some, the same kind of variability. Um, it's, not, it's not meant to be aesthetic necessarily, although it creates its own kind of interesting aesthetic. <laughs> it does, yeah. It gives you that variability. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great idea. Yeah, no, that's I, right. It's like, I think, I think springs are sort of the answer to insecure, like uh, in, in, in precise yeah. measurements. Um, yeah. the springs are answer to many things. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan, of course, <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, uh, when, when it comes to these, these joints, it's indeed like you have like also measurement error itself is something that you could to some degree overcome with, uh, with springs. It's actually something that I've never quite added to the paper, but something that I've always been sort of interested in as well is that, um, when you're modeling these things, you have sort of the same problem, right? Like if you're modeling it, you're like, indeed, you're trying to figure out like, okay, how much curve is like going to be affected into my mechanism? And I'm going to adjust all the mechanisms, all the other all joints so that they work uh, with, with the amount of curve that is uh, in there. If you had like springs in there, anyhow, you actually don't need to worry about that. Like they can be exactly the same size, right? And you just like, because the spring will compensate, they will actually hold it in place. Um, so it, it does take some additional dimension there of like modeling complexity out of the equation as well. Now, Obviously, if you go to 3D, you're sort of already solved that problem on a different on a different level somehow. Like you're not even modeling the joints anymore. That's what the software does at this point. So uh, that's why it never really made it into the actual paper. But <laughs> something that I've always been sort of interested in as well. Yeah. That's great. Thanks again. Yeah, I'll let some other people ask questions. All right. I think Lithig had his hand up second, and then Katya after that. Uh Hi, Thais. Uh, fantastic work and great talk. Um, Thank you. I was wondering if you have some more insights in what makes a, um, an assembly of a model a, a good assembly. I have some uh, thoughts how it might work, but I'm interested if you can tell a bit more about how that works. You mean on the automatic side of the, of the uh, algorithm, like how to yes. judge the quality? Yeah. All right, so first, um, for everybody to get some context, like uh, Ludwig is actually also part of the of the uh, paper that where we made the 3D modeling environment. So uh, very happy to have him here in the call. <laughs> um, but like, yeah, so um, yeah, we have like a, a heuristic function that has like, that takes uh, six different heuristics into consideration when, um, when evaluating each of these assemblies. Um, some of them are more intuitive than others. So like, I think ones that are relatively intuitive is for example, compactness of a model. Um, you can imagine if you're trying to assemble the plates and the plate is sticking out in an odd dimension, um, that's probably not going to be a great assembly. Um, so that's, uh, that's certainly one factor that, that we uh, quickly, quickly considered. Another, another one that's so, somewhat intuitive as well is collisions in the model, of course. Like you don't want to have plates that intersect with each other. Um, that, that's also reasonably obvious. Uh, then, then one that is particularly interesting, I think, in the context of these laser structures is that um, it looks into like trying to make symmetrical assemblies. Um, it turns out like from the models repository that, that, that we looked at before these hundred models, um, 80 of them had actually some degree of symmetry in there. So just by guiding, by, by analyzing symmetries on the cutting plans, uh, on the individual plates, and then finding out like how the model assembled, uh, in a symmetrical way as well, uh, that, that really helps to kind of get it into a, a good orientation and makes therefore the, the, the assemblies also better. Um, and then there are some somewhat less obvious ones. They are more like a, a consequence of how we are assembling them. So for example, the amount of joints that you are like kind of closing with every plate is, is, is a big factor. It's just like, it's, it says more something about the sequence in which you end up assembling it. Because like, if you, if you're closing a lot of joints with a plate, you essentially, you reduce the ambiguity in the model, right? You're like, um, if, if you have like, um, the, the bottom plate of the VR headset, there's a lot of ways in which other plates can be joined into it, but the more joints you can close in by adding each plate. Um, the, the more certain the algorithm will be that the other plates that it's going to assemble will be correct. Um, and then, then one, one last one that is also, yeah, that takes a little bit of like, I, I, you will get it, but I'm not sure if everybody will, um, but you're like, um, every plate poses constraints on the other plates that are to be assembled in there, right? Like by the shape of their joints, by the location of their joints and by the type of their joints. And so, uh, these constraints sort of like the more constraints you kind of leverage, the better a plate you have assembled here. So if you look at this particular state, this is a nice one uh, that you see in this slide here. So um, if you're now assembling that top plate there, it actually closes two constraints, right? It, it closes a constraint from this plate and it confirms a constraint from that plate. And so that's much better to assemble right now than if you had assembled it without one of these side plates that were assembled in place. Because again, like if one of these side plates was not there, it's super ambiguous where exactly that plate has to go. Um, so these are some of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, heuristics that we use in order to kind of assess each of these states. 
Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, like the paper is in in submission right now, so I can be very happy to share more. We can we can maybe afterwards have a, have a look at some of it. Um, but um, yeah, it's still early research. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking it works reasonably really well. Cool. We got like eighty percent of the models that I just showed you. They kind of automatically assemble this way. Um, with the exception, the one thing that we're really bad with, with this algorithm, and you can kind of guess that also from the way the algorithm works, like it uses the structure of the joints as the information here. And as a result, like uh, the dinosaur model, for example, that you saw before, um, has not much information in the structure of the joints, right? Like it's like they're all cross joints. They're all sort of like in, in, in line with each other. So which vertebra, vertebra goes where in the dinosaur is sort of like pretty undecisive for the algorithm. There are no constraints being confirmed. There is no... There is no notion of that. Like you would actually need to have like some sort of image of the result. Yeah, in order to, but really know to be fair, humans might also have a difficult time deciding <laughs> which. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Work. This is not easy to assemble manually either. So what we're doing yeah. as a follow up, and that's sort of like future future work, is that we're trying to use an image as guidance. So if you have like an image, you would know where plates could be, like based on the shape of the model rather than the joints of the model, um, and then use that to further inform the algorithm. But that's sort of that's something that that is certainly. I cannot confirm this, the, the results of that yet. <laughs> right, great insight, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks, thanks Ludwig. Uh, Katya, you're up next. Yeah, hi, um, I'm just curious um, because I've mostly come across uh, laser cutting in the context of HCI labs where it's <laughs> used for prototyping. That's and right. I'm just kind of curious um, how it's used in industry. Like, do they use it for the same purpose or is it like they, they have Different applications, or they use different materials. Like, how does it differ from like your typical HCI lab? Yeah, so uh, good question. Um, in industry, there is certainly um, different. Like, it, it, what you see in these HCI labs that you've seen so far, you see also the materials that you've seen here, like these plywood sort mm -hmm. of like applications. Exactly. Um, most industrial applications are like kind of more powerful types of lasers that also kind of cut through steel, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can imagine how it is for a lot of like precision manufacturing. It's actually a great way. Um, to kind of quickly get to a result and also to um, get an enormous amount of precision out somehow. So the alternative would be a milling machine, which is much slower. Um, so it's used in that in that sort of context, like where you just like need to have like fast, precise fabrication. Um, mm -hmm. And then then like other other use cases, like you you also do find wood, right? Like so you find like these these sort of like uh, models that you might find at your um, uh, like which are just like so sort of containers and stuff like that. They can also be laser cut relatively quickly or paper applications even for uh, for cardboard. Um, it's mostly when you need very versatile kind of uh, use of the tools. Like everything else, then there is like uh, if if you want to do, for example, paper cutting, there is more efficient ways of doing it, which is just stencing it, right? So uh, it's not not so much used in the super high end of the mass production scale here. Um, I do believe that it's like a tool that that kind of has a lot of potential in moving forwards. Like we use it also a lot in education, for example. Um, which is just sort of an interesting use case if you think of it. Like you might you might want to, in an educational context, you might want to teach people about like how to build things and, and mechanical construction. But if you wanted to do that, for example, with a 3D printer, you would have to like print overnight and then, you know, <laughs> like some other day in the future have a result. A laser cutter is extremely fast and allows you to process natural materials. So you can like in, 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 in the same session, which you're teaching the, the way to make the model, um, you could already produce the model, and we're actually doing that right now in in, in test settings. So we're having like cool. um, students in high school make like musical instruments, for example, like cajons and uh, speakers, and um, and and I, I mean I need to I'm just super excited about this. But like we also and and Ludwig will smile now. It's also possible to make like a laser cut guitar. <laughs> um, <laughs> so these are sort of the things that if you think of it like. Um, I just like try to like uh, if I was a student in high school and I had like build a guitar with a laser cutter, I think I would end up tell, telling all of my friends the rest of my life about the fact that I build a, build a guitar with a laser cutter somehow, right? So mm -hmm. I think I think that has an enormous potential. Like just the the excitement that you would create around like the ability to create stuff yourself and to um, fa fabricate yourself is I think something that in an educational context is currently a little bit undervalued, but would really really bring in a big big potential change here. Mm -hmm. And I think laser cutters are just the right machine to do that. I think like that's that's really where 3D printing is not quite uh, on par yet. Mm. Gosh, cool. Thank you.